Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Michigan State Wealth Management Association podcast. My name is Costa Giannotis, and I am the treasurer of WMA. Our guest today is Ben Carlson, Director of Institutional Advising at Ritholtz Wealth Management. Ben attended Hope College and Grand Valley State University. He is a CFA charter holder, writes a blog called A Wealth of Common Sense, and also records a weekly podcast called Animal Spirits. We've got a great episode for you, so stay tuned. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MSU Wealth Management Association podcast. Our guest today is Ben Carlson from Ritholtz Wealth Management. Ben, thank you so much for being here. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. All right. So what we're trying to figure out here is we're trying to help students figure out, you know, why they'd want to become a financial advisor, why they'd want to work in the wealth management space. So could you tell us a little bit about your career path? Uh, Did you always want to work in the financial services industry? I didn't really have any clue what I wanted to do. So I, I was heading into my senior year of college and went off to, I went to a small school, Hope College on the west side of Michigan and liberal arts school. And I really didn't have any plan. And I realized going into my senior year, like, I don't know what I want to do. I was in business and finance and I knew I wanted to work with numbers, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if I was going to work for a bank or what. So I, I went off to Philadelphia for an internship program for a semester and ended up working there with uh, with an investment uh, sell side analyst. So they, these are the analysts that will cover a stock or a sector, and they'll they'll place the buy or sell or hold ratings on them. So I did that, and that kind of gave me the the itch to try to understand the markets some more because I realized I had no clue. I mean, the the first day I showed up there, I didn't know what a stock or a bond was. I I mean, my whole slate was just just completely empty. And so I realized there was a huge learning curve for me and I had better start getting, you know, some more of that, that real, you know, real world knowledge. So that was kind of my way I backed into the investment world. Um, so I, I realized I wanted to get into it, started learning some more, got a job uh, after school working for an investment consulting firm. And um, that was more on the, the institutional side, I think. So working with larger organizations like pensions and endowments and foundations and some of these, these, these bigger firms. And we had a few individuals and that was a real eye-opening experience for me just to learn, understand the business better and how these, how these places looked at things like portfolio management and creating investment plans and that sort of thing. And, and so for me, it was more of a gradual process. It wasn't anything that I sought out to do, I kind of backed into it and realized, okay, I actually really enjoy this. And there's so many things about the markets and helping people plan for this stuff that, that are interesting, that it was more that I kind of fell into it more than, than I sought it out. Can you talk a little bit about, we know you're a CFA charter holder, so can you talk a little bit about how that has kind of um, maybe early on helped you gain more knowledge and then talk about your experience and the process of going through those exams um, and everything like that? I, I realized again early on that I even when I got into the working world that there was still so much for me to learn and I didn't I debated back and forth between do I need to go back for an MBA or do I need to do more something that's more niche like the CFA and, and the CFA for those who don't know it's more geared toward portfolio management and analysis and it's a three-year program and it was self-study and at the time my girlfriend who's now my wife we were living in separate cities as she was going back to school and I was working so it, it worked out well that it was a self-study program. Um, it, it took three years to to get through, and I, I just realized it would be a way for me to help expand my knowledge because it's it's one of those programs where, it, you know, it's it's a mile wide but an inch deep. So there's there's just tons of stuff that that is covered in those uh, in the curriculum there. So, and the other thing is, I, I was in the process. I I was three years into the working world and starting to apply for new jobs, and I realized so many of the jobs were now requiring a CFA if I wanted to be some sort of portfolio analyst or equity analyst at one of these investment firms they wanted you to have it or at least see that you were going down that route so it was turning into something that was table stakes for me that I needed to get so actually I I think I was just sitting for the first level test as I was interviewing for places and the employer that ended up hiring me they liked the fact that I was going to do that because it showed initiative that I cared. So it, it's one of those things where going through a program like that is not going to turn you into the next Warren Buffett. And so <laughs> if, if that's your, your your idea of going into it, you know, you're, you're, you're wrong. But 
but it does show a potential employer that you have initiative and that you want to put in the time and effort to study because it's a lot. And I think they say that the average hours studied for a test like that is like 300 hours. And in my experience, that was probably about right. And so it was, it, it was time and effort. And it's, it's one of those things where you're, you're more trying to show someone that you will put in the time to go through something like that. So I do think it was worthwhile in that it, it it didn't necessarily make me the the world's greatest investor, but it 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 helped me understand what was going on because I I realized early on in my career there was just words and phrases people were using to describe the markets that I I literally didn't understand, and I mean I'm going back after meetings with people and I'm pulling up Investopedia and what is he talking about? And I had to look it up, and going through the CFA program was great for me because some of the stuff I was learning were stuff that was applicable to my, my day job and helped me that way too. So it, it was definitely a, uh, it, 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 a lot of it depends on, on your career path and what you're going for. But for, for me, it was definitely worthwhile in terms of giving me a broader base of knowledge and then helping me, you know, get my foot in the door to a few employers too. All right. So I think a lot of our listeners are probably going to take the CFP route. I think that's something that me and Justin are definitely going to do. Um, can you just kind of talk about a little bit, maybe compare and contrast the two, the CFA versus the CFP, and then talk about your kind of specific study process. I think a lot of our listeners would gain um, some some valuable knowledge from just how you kind of work through balancing work and then also studying and then doing all that uh, at the same time. Yeah, I, I've heard, I know a lot of people who have the CFP. I, I know a few people who have actually done both of them, which right. I think is probably overkill unless you're going to be someone who's going to be a financial advisor who's going to be managing your own book of business and also doing investing. I think that's probably overkill. I actually think if I had to go back and do it again and I'm starting out today in your shoes, I think the CFP is much more valuable. And there's a few reasons for that. One, I think the the investment industry is, is just going under taking these these huge sea changes right now where you have these things like ETFs and index funds that are that are really taking over in the prospect for active management and portfolio analysis. While that stuff will always be um, part of the process, it's it's not nearly as important as it once was. And I think there's something like 300,000 CFAs and there's two or 300,000 that, that try to take it every year. And so it, it's, it's something that is just it's not going to get you quite as far unless you really want to have your head to the grindstone and you're going to be a portfolio manager and you're going to be an analyst and, and you have to go that route. But I think the CFP is more important these days because there's just so much more of a need for financial advice. So every day for the next 15 years or so, there's going to be 10,000 baby boomers retiring. Those people think they need investment advice and how to navigate the markets. And to some extent they do, but the thing that they really need is financial advice. They want to know that they're going to be okay. They want to know um, that their insurance needs are met or that they can spend whatever money they have or that they have enough money to begin with. And so financial advice, I think, is going to be super important going forward. And that's not just for older people. That's for younger people, too, young professionals who are still trying to understand what they need to do with their money and how to save for retirement and these things. So I think the CFP is, is important in terms of, of studying. I, I've heard that the the tests are probably similar and the workload maybe is similar in terms. It's, it's just a different uh, curriculum. But I just found for me just making it part of my part of my routine and, and making it, you know, every night I'd block out time and I would study. And, and it was kind of hard because I, I guess I took it three or four years after school. So I was out of that studying mindset. So getting back into that and setting aside a time that, you know, I'm sure that there's probably more resources now, too. I, I use things like study guides and there was just starting to be these message boards. I'm sure there's way more of that now where you can share because a lot of the CFA stuff was just very individual and there there wasn't really anyone else to lean on and i took as many practice tests as i could and i used a lot of the study guides and and the the message boards were just starting when i was taking it and that helped a little bit in terms of people sharing stuff that's worked for them so uh, yeah i know it's it's kind of a a self-starter process and you have to be a self-starter to go through it but leaning on other resources and people was helpful for me just to try to get through it because it, it can be overwhelming if you if you try to take it on all at once yeah, absolutely. I think those those message boards have definitely grown in popularity, especially on like Reddit and different things like that. So there's definitely a huge um, group of people that that drive those um, for sure. But I think so the um, oh, sorry, but, no, but the, 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 the see that that's certainly something that our firm. So we we are in wealth management, and we certainly talk a lot about the markets and investing. But um, for our client facing advisors, the, the CFP is certainly something that when we're looking for bringing new advisors in, that's something we're looking at. So again, I think 
if you want to get into this space, it's going to be something that's turning into table stakes. So the fact that you guys are already looking at that, that's that's certainly something that I think can, can help you out uh, when you're looking for future employers. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, uh, our professor, she still has talked about it's, it's starting to become like a requirement at this point to have the CFP to get into into the space for sure. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. So we, we know that you you currently work remotely in Grand Rapids and you had even before the pandemic. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why you chose to kind of work remotely sort of on a permanent basis? And then also, can you compare like working remotely before the pandemic and then after? Like, is it the same? Is, are there some things that are a little bit different? Yeah, we were pretty lucky. I was actually the very first person at our company to work remotely. I joined the company five years ago. And at that point, they're headquartered in New York City, you know, office in Manhattan. And I had just had my my wife and I just had our daughter and I think she was one years old. And I had started talking with this firm about uh, coming on and joining them because I, I had started writing and we realized we had similar interests and principles and values in terms of how we wanted to invest on behalf of clients. And so we realized that it made sense to for, for me to join the firm. And initially we talked about me moving to Manhattan, but because we had just had a child and we had friends and family in, in Michigan, that was a conversation that never like got off the ground with my wife. And I, I actually at first thought, okay, this just isn't going to work because that, that, that's just a, a deal breaker. And talked to them a little more and realized our, our client base was not necessarily based in New York. Our clients were based all across the country because a lot of them were finding us uh, through the internet and stuff we wrote or podcasts or TV appearances. And so that actually helped me say, you know, what if we tried this remotely? And I, I brought it up to them and they, to their credit, the, the company, I thought they were going to tell me to buzz off. They said, yeah, why, why couldn't we? Technology makes it easier than ever to communicate and stay in touch. And if, as long as you're okay, working remotely and not being in the office and occasionally flying here and, and seeing us or seeing some clients in other cities, why not? So I, I came on and, and right after me, there was a few more people that came on and now we have roughly half of our, our whole staff. I think we have 32 people. I think half of them work remotely. Half of them are in the New York City office. So we were pretty lucky coming into the pandemic in that we already had a remote system. We're pretty much a paperless firm. Our, our operations team had set that in place. So a lot of stuff is using DocuSign and, and all, a lot of our clients are used to talking over video calls and the telephone. And so I'd say, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent of our clients we've actually never met in person. So we were pretty well primed for this before it began. There was a few changes we had to make. You know, now we we do a couple Zoom meetings with uh, the firm every week for everyone checking in. We didn't do a lot of those before, but we, we've utilized tools like Slack to keep together and talk in little teams and groups. And and so there, there's things that we've used technology wise that have helped, but we, we were fairly lucky because I've talked to other financial advisors who said, you know, the, the problem is when something like this happens in, in a bear market, that's typically when people, you know, when markets are crashing and prices are falling, people are panicking. A lot of times that's when they're going to make a change. So whether they use a financial advisor that they realize, okay, this person is not doing any good for me. I'm going to make a change and find someone who is because this person obviously didn't have a plan for this. Or, you know, I've been doing this myself and I realize I don't want to deal with something like this. This is a scary situation. I'm going to make a change. So for us business wise, that that's actually when the most stuff starts happening and people reach out to us and want to talk about becoming a, a client. And so I talked to a lot of other advisors who said, you know, this would have been a great time for me to bring on new business. Unfortunately, I only meet with people face to face and I couldn't hear. So for us, it, you know, it was, a, I guess, more luck than, than anything else. But it was easy because our, our business model didn't change since we've been using technology to, to talk to people. And, and I, I guess that's, that's kind of something to think about as a younger advisor, too, is just instilling that sort of thing early on in your clients that, you know, you don't need to hop in your car and come see me every time we, we want to talk, it, it, it's so much easier to do stuff these days. And, and, and for our clients, they'd already been kind of, you know, preconditioned to do that. So, so for us, the, the pandemic really hasn't changed much about our business. If anything, it, it's helped because we were already doing a lot of the things that people are trying to shift to now. So yeah, that the use of technology and different ways to communicate is definitely something that, that is going to be, you know, vital to financial advisors going forward. No, yeah, I would 100% agree, and um, I think Justin would too. Uh, even even this past summer, when we interned with uh, Plant Plant Moran together, 
Um, they even said that there's there's really no reason to go and fly and meet a client anymore, especially now that we can just do Zooms or Teams meetings. I mean, you, you get the face to face, but you don't necessarily have to incur that travel expense or, or anything like that. So 100%. Um, so you mentioned that you um, sort of got picked up by Ritholtz just through writing your blog and, and creating content. So can you talk a little bit of more? A little bit more about how that how you kind of got started with the blog and how it kind of fits into your career do you think it's kind of made you a better advisor or and how do you kind of balance the the writing the blog and and that content creation with your career it it's certainly something that when i started it i believe i started the blog in 2013 and i had, I had been reading blogs for a number of years and just just thought to myself, you know what, I kind of have something to say. I actually was in getting my MBA and had a classmate who had done it himself and started one. And and I did a presentation on personal financing class, which, you know, no one really cares about, but I obviously cared about it a lot. And he said, you know, you should try just put some of these thoughts down and have more people read them. And I, I said, I, I don't know who's going to read this stuff. And he helped me set it up. And I kind of did it on a whim. I didn't really have any grand plan. I didn't, I didn't say, you know, I'm going to start this content get into this content game and then it's going to change my career trajectory i had no you know you know no reservations about that at all i was just doing it because it was something to do and kind of had got it through this class project and it ended up working out where it started slowly gaining traction and i got to know a lot of the other people who were in this this blogging community who had similar views of the world and as myself and would would share it with other people and and they slowly helped me build an audience so I went, I went into it with very low expectations, which I, I think was helpful because if I would have said, I'm going to totally change my career by writing this blog, then I, I think I would have probably given up on it after a few months because the first few months, no one was reading it at all. And so if, if I would have placed those undue expectations on myself, I probably wouldn't have stuck with it because the first you know five or six months, it was friends and family reading it. And those are the people that I was writing for anyway is because they were the ones coming to me with questions about the market and their 401k and, and what to do about certain things. So I was trying to write it with them in mind. And that was actually kind of a blessing in disguise, too, because a lot of people who read it really liked the fact that I was I was trying to put it in to, um, you know, break it down into the most common denominator that, that people could actually understand. And so once I started writing more and I got to know these guys, the, the job that I had, I, I would actually fly out to New York a few times a year to, to meet with with our money managers that we were dealing with. And I got to know these guys in New York a little bit who also were blogging. And, and these guys, uh, Barry Ritholtz and Josh Brown, they were like my heroes that I'd been following. Josh is on CNBC and Barry had been on CNBC and is on Bloomberg. And these guys have been writing for years. Barry was one of the first financial bloggers ever. He started in like 1999 and it would take him a half hour to write a post. And then he would spend another half hour doing the HTML on it because there was no such thing as WordPress or Tumblr or Medium back in the day. So he had to do all the coding himself just to make a blog. They didn't even exist. So that's how long he's been doing it for. And getting to know those guys was great because they were offering me feedback. And, and I actually got to know them for about a year before ever even talking about joining the firm. And after a while, I started talking about that I'd been working in the institutional world. And, you know, it was great because I was learning a lot. But I really wanted to, you know, now that I've been writing and hearing feedback from people, wanting to work with smaller clients and more individuals and broaden my horizon a little bit because I was working for a single institution and organization. And they were technically my only client. And, and while it was... It was a great job and I learned a lot and I was there for about 10 years. I, I just really wanted to move on and try something else. And and they said, well, what exactly do you want to do? And I kind of laid it out for him. And Josh Brown, to his credit, said, OK, come do that for us. And that's how we worked it out. And, and for me, again, I, I never if I would have gone into it thinking, all right, this is going to turn into my dream job because I'm writing a blog, I would have told I would have said you were nuts when I started it. And that's kind of the way things worked out. But because they had been blogging for so long, they grew an audience and they had people saying eventually, you know what, we like the way you think about the world. We like the way that you think about markets and investing. Maybe you should manage money for us. And, and at first, Josh and Barry turned people away and said, no, that, you know, we don't do that. And eventually they created a firm. And then I, I came into it too. And we realized, okay, this is actually a, a huge benefit for us because we have people who already kind of understand our message they feel like they know us a little better. It's not someone you're meeting for the first time. They've been reading you for a while. They they understand, and there's a level of trust there that we were building that we really didn't think, okay, let's let's press this advantage. And once we realized that, we said, okay, we can make a business out of this. So we don't have any people in the sales or development department. Our content and writing is how we communicate not only with prospective clients that might come join us, but also current clients. And so 
they're not constantly calling our advisors saying, what is going on in the markets today? You know, what do you guys think about this? Because they're reading it because, you know, on a daily basis, at least one of us at the firm is going to be talking on a podcast or doing a TV appearance or talking, writing on our blog about what we think and providing context. And what that does for our financial advisors is it allows them to spend more time talking to the clients about their specific financial plan instead of worrying about what's going on in the markets. And so putting it out there um, has been great for us. And what I tell a lot of younger advisors or aspiring advisors who talk about this, you know, they, they, they ask all the time, how do I get into the blogging game and how do I do this and how do I build an audience? And I don't even think going into it with that mindset is helpful because trying to build an audience is really hard. And if I started today to try to do it again, it, it wouldn't be easy, but your audience in a lot of ways is your clients. And the great thing about writing and putting content out there is you can build a library and it, it shows that you're an expert. And so if you have a specific niche that you, that you write about and, and you're a, you know, tax planning is, is your big thing or, um, you know, setting up asset allocation or where your, where your assets are located. If you write about these specific topics, people will find you because you have expert, you know, don't domain expert on this stuff. And when you have, questions from clients and and the funny thing is is that the questions are almost always the same the market environment changes but the questions you'll get about it will be the same you can build a library of stuff that you've written and say oh i already wrote about this in 2017 here take a look take and, and, it, and it and it saves you time and effort from having to explain it a hundred different times and so we've just found that that producing content is so helpful and you know Growing an audience and stuff that 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 certainly is 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 interesting, but but the the client aspect of it of being able to communicate with them and and provide context and perspective for them, without them having to beat down your door all the time every time the stock market falls five percent, is very helpful because then you can only have conversations with them when you really need to and something truly is different with their financial circumstances, not just the markets. Absolutely, um, yeah, that that's a great answer. Um, so I guess leading off of that, um, what what would you say some of your more favorite blogs are? And then what would you kind of recommend, not just blogs, but just general reading materials, kind of like younger advisors kind of get their feet wet, or maybe even um, people who aren't advisors yet, maybe college students looking to get into the industry, just some general reading material that they can uh, gain some quick knowledge and, and be able to talk about the markets. Yeah, so all, all the blogs that my team write are, are great. So Josh Brown writes the Reform Broker, broker uh, Barry Ridholtz does the big picture. My podcast co-host Michael Batnick writes uh, called The Irrelevant Investor. Uh, Blair Ducanet is one of our advisors who's joined in the last couple of years. She, she writes something called The Bell Curve. And then we have a, a teacher turned advisor named uh, Tony Isola, who writes a blog called The Teachable Moment, and it's based, his niche is teachers specifically. Um, but Michael Kitsis writes a blog called Nerd's Eye View that is is certainly must read for all financial advisors because he he dives deep into topics specifically related to advisors. Um, there, there's so much other stuff out there in podcasts. And I think the one of the biggest things for me, because it, it is hard sometimes, there, there's so much information out there these days in podcasts and blogs and financial news media. I found for me help. It was so helpful to just read read a lot of books. When when I realized I, I was so far behind where I needed to be, where I wanted to be in terms of knowledge, I had to be that self starter and and learn a lot. And I realized, okay, this learning thing is not done just because I'm done with school. And so so just books. Every one that I met my first few years of out of college, I would say, what is your what are two or three of your favorite books on investing or the markets or the any pick a topic. And I would get these and I started compiling a list and I would just check these books off the list and go through and, and and just going through that really helps you understand the lingo of the industry and what's going on in the markets and and makes you just more informed about history and what's going on and what's happened before. And, and I think that can just just uh, again, showing that initiative is helpful too. that you're, you're just going to be more of a lifelong learner and, and, and keep at keep at it with this stuff and, and constantly trying to figure out um you know, what came before you and what's coming next, basically. For sure. Um, so again, let's let's switch gears just a little bit here and talk. Um, now, you you are you're in the institutional advising space. And for um, can you kind of just explain the difference between that and probably the more well known, like personal financial planning, um, just for our listeners who might not know the difference? Yeah. And I got into the institutional space again, kind of by accident which is another thing that I tell a lot of young people is is trying to plan out your career, especially right out of college, is so difficult because you just never know. If I would have, if you would have told me this is the path I was going to take 
I, I don't think I could have planned it. You know, it, it just a lot of stuff just happens. And so I, I worked it out. So I, I actually my first job was in the Detroit area working for a small private institutional consulting firm. I think there was six or five of us at the at the firm it was pretty small, which is good for me at the time. Being someone just out of school, I, I, I got paid basically nothing in salary, but I learned a ton because there was only five of us there and, and got to have a hand in a little bit of everything. But I learned pretty quickly about the institutional world because that, that was our main client focus. And we worked with places like hospitals and insurance companies, and they would have a, a pension plan for their, their employees or an endowment fund, which was used to make charitable gifts or a foundation um, or an operating account. And I, I realized, you know, a lot of these organizations have a ton of money. And so if you're working in the financial advisor space, you know, it's typical that anything above, say, you know, five million dollars is is a pretty decent sized client. Ten million is considered, you know, ultra high net worth. But dealing with organizations, these these places have hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of dollars. And so it's different in a lot of ways in terms of the politics involved. And you're, you're dealing more with group decisions where if, if you're working with a family or an individual or a couple, typically there's there's one person or maybe two who are going to make decisions. They'll, they'll make them very quick. In the institutional space, you're dealing with boards and committees and and CEOs and CFOs and all the all these people who want to have a say in the decision. So there's way more politics involved and. You have to get really good at selling your um, stuff that you want to tell people. So you have to you, you have to make a good sales pitch if you want someone to do something or follow your prescription. Because you're not just trying to convince one people, you're tra- person. You're trying to convince a, a bunch of people, and that's a skill that was didn't come easy for me. I was I was never I could never be a, a car salesman. Um, it was just not in my personality. I have friends who who have zero book smarts, but they know people and they know how to sell. And that, that just was never me. And so that's something that I had to learn too, that that selling yourself and selling your ideas is really important because it, it, you could be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't effectively communicate it and you can't sell your ideas and analysis to people in a way that they understand, then it, it really doesn't matter how good your ideas are if you can't get them by to people. So the, the politics involved is huge. And the other thing is, even though you're dealing with so much more money and you know a lot of our clients at my first firm were hundreds of millions of dollars. But you realize in a lot of ways, it's just another zero. And, and what I mean by that is the investment principles that work for someone with a million dollars don't have to be different from someone who has a hundred million dollars. You know, the, the same evergreen investing principles still apply. And I found that way too many people would try to overcomplicate the process and make it more complex than it needed to be when just simplifying and, and getting down to the, you know, the, the building blocks of portfolio management and asset allocation and investment planning, those things were really important. And, and my my initial boss in the industry for the first three years taught me a lot of that, how important things like asset allocation were in setting a, a documented investment policy statement that lays out everything so people had to go through like a checklist before they could change anything. And so when you're dealing with all these different people and they all want to have a say in the decision, if everything is documented, but they can't really change it without you know, going through some sort of vote or something. So getting everything documented and, and having an investment policy statement and all that stuff was really important because I assumed first, first, you know, right out of the bat that, okay, stock picking is the most important thing about creating a portfolio. Of course, you know, you have to pick the best stocks, but that that's, that's so far down the line after you create the right policies and guidelines and the asset allocation and pick the right money managers to, or, or ETFs or funds to, to implement those views. So um, it was definitely a learning curve for me and the institutional space was a, was a good way to do that for me because you had all these different competing goals and interests and opinions. And I got to see how to really craft a, a comprehensive investment plan for these places, as opposed to just figuring out how to pick the right stocks. Right. And I think that's, that's interesting that you say that, um, that you did that for institutional clients. Cause I think a lot of the things, and you mentioned this, but I think a lot of those things apply to individuals as well. So it's, they're a lot more similar than I think people realize the institutional versus the, the more personal, like one-on-one um, financial planning. Um, so, so just one last question here before we let, we wrap up and you kind of touched on this about um, learning how to kind of sell your services, but what would, what would maybe be some things that you would tell maybe your younger self in terms of like, you know, get really good at these things and you'll be you'll be fine in, in terms of like advancing in your career and, and getting better opportunities. Yeah, I, I think the, the other thing about learning is is just learning a, a wide range of topics. So, I mean, if I could go back to do do college all over again, 
I probably I, I did you know the business management route and and got accounting and economics on the side and because we actually didn't have a finance degree at Hope because it was liberal arts school but I, I the the understanding of of human psychology and behavior is so important to the markets because those are the things that really drive the markets is understanding people and, and so understanding human nature and how I I would have gone and got a minor in psychology or something in college if I could have now going back on it now so understanding just a wide range of topics and, and having really, um, you know, just some sort of depth there, I, I think is, is really helpful in understanding people. Again, I, I think sales is important. Um, the ability to communicate, especially when you're a younger person and you're trying to get your ideas across and you're the low man on the totem pole. I think the ability to effectively communicate in as few words as possible, um, whether that's in a short email or just a short 30 or 60 second elevator pitch, I think you have to get really good at that because a lot of people above you aren't going to have the time of day to sit there and, and listen to you for, you know, if you have a 10 page report, they're not, they're not going to care. They want it in, in short, succinct, easy to understand. Why does this matter to me? So I think any way you can become a better, more effective communicator, whether that's through writing or talking or selling or PowerPoint presentations, whatever it is, figure out a way to do that effectively and simplify as much as you can so people because people are busy and they don't have a lot of time and, and so figuring out that way um to c communicate effectively is helpful um i always like this this um advice from theo epstein who's the guy who was a savior for the boston red sox as their gm and then he came in and won a title for the cubs too he said something along the lines of listen whoever your boss is when you're first starting out they have 20 percent of their job that they absolutely hate so go to your boss tell them listen what is this 20% that you hate doing? How can I make it easier for you and take some of that off of your plate and, and do it for you? And so, so I think figuring out how to make yourself indispensable at work like that is, is really helpful, especially when you're trying to separate yourself when you're just starting out on the job. Absolutely. That's, that's a uh, really good advice. I had not heard that before, but I'm, I'm definitely going to take that, take that advice into my career um, for sure. And I would encourage all the listeners to do that. The other thing I would say too is, um, just something that you mentioned, um, getting that elevator pitch and being able to talk. I think it's important, too, to kind of practice that. And even though it's awkward with maybe like one of your friends, just be like, hey, can I just talk to you for, for a minute and, and work on my elevator pitch? It's awkward at first, but I think the more you do it, the better you're going to get just like everything. So so I've, I've heard people who actually film themselves doing this stuff. And, and I've uh, I've been lucky enough to do a few speeches at conferences and stuff. And I, I thought, you know what? it shouldn't be that hard. I create, I type up a speech and I give it away. And, and again, because I'm not a natural salesperson, that, that kind of stuff doesn't come easy to me. So my, my New Yorker colleagues, Josh and Barry, they were like made for this. They can, they can get in front of a TV camera or they can get in front of a stage and they're perfectly comfortable speaking. And for me, that just wasn't who I was. That's not my personality. And so I actually had to work at it a little bit because one of the first speeches I did, uh, Maybe it wasn't as bad as I had internally, but I, I felt like I bombed and I did awful. And and I realized, okay, you know what? I actually have to work at this and I have to practice a little bit more. And and I did that where I would tape myself and I'd, I'd give presentations to my wife um, to practice. And so some people have that natural ability to speak, but a lot of them really put a lot of time and effort into it, understanding it. And, and yeah, like you said, practicing that stuff in front of other people is very helpful because if you say it out loud and you realize like, oh, you know what? Actually saying that out loud, that doesn't that just doesn't sound no no one talks like that so it, it can be very helpful yeah absolutely it's the, it's the east coast genes they that they have so yeah really first <laughs> um well thanks ben I, we we had a great time asking you these questions and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh to talk to two college students so um thank you of course thanks guys if you like what you heard today Hit subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The MSU Wealth Management Association is a student group at Michigan State aimed at training the next generation of financial advisors. For more information, check out our website, msuwma.com. See you guys next week. Mm -hmm.